I am Pastor David Becker, Pastor of St. John's Lutheran Church of Aiken. Thank you for tuning in today. Thanks also to KKIN Radio for broadcasting this service. It's also available online at stjohnaitkin at stjohnaitkin.org. Um, we are now holding in-person services at 9 a.m. On this, the 15th Sunday after Pentecost, we make our beginning in the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Beloved in the Lord, let us draw near with a true heart and confess our sins unto God our Father, beseeching him in the name of our Lord Jesus Christ to grant us forgiveness. Our help is in the name of the Lord, who made heaven and earth. I said I will confess my transgressions unto the Lord, and you forgave the iniquity of my sin. We now confess our sins. O oh, Almighty God, merciful Father, I, a poor, miserable sinner, confess unto you all my sins and iniquities with which I have ever offended you, and justly deserved your temporal and eternal punishment. But I am heartily sorry for them and sincerely repent of them. And I pray you of your boundless mercy, and for the sake of the holy, innocent, bitter sufferings and death of thy beloved Son, Jesus Christ, to be gracious and merciful to me, a poor, sinful being. Upon this your confession, I by virtue of my office as a call and ordained servant of the word, announce the grace of God unto you, and in the stead and by the command of my Lord Jesus Christ, I forgive you all your sins in the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Our intro it is from Psalm 28. The Lord is the strength of his people. He is the saving refuge of his anointed. To you, O Lord, I call my rock. Be not deaf to me, lest if you be silent to me, I become like those who go down to the pit. Hear the voice of my pleas for mercy when I cry to you for help. When I lift up my hands toward your most holy sanctuary, blessed be the Lord for he has heard the voice of my pleas for mercy. The Lord is my strength and my shield. In him my heart trusts and I am helped. My heart exalts and with my song I give thanks to him. Glory be to the Father and to the Son and to the Holy Spirit as it was in the beginning, is now and will be forever. Amen. The Lord is the strength of his people. He is the saving refuge of his anointed. Let us pray. O oh Lord, let your merciful ears be open to the prayers of your humble servants, and grant that what they ask may be in accord with your gracious will. Through Jesus Christ, your Son, our Lord, who lives and reigns with you in the Holy Spirit, one God, now and forever. Amen. Our first lesson, our Old Testament lesson, comes from the book of Isaiah, chapter 35, and I'll begin the fourth verse. Say to those who have an anxious heart, Be strong, fear not. Behold, your God will come with vengeance, with the recompense of God. He will come and save you. Then the eyes of the blind shall be opened, and the ears of the deaf unstopped. Then shall the lame man leap like a deer, and the tongue of the mute sing for joy. For waters break forth in the wilderness and streams in the desert. The burning sand shall become a pool, and the thirsty ground springs of water. In the haunt of jackals where they lie down, the grass shall become reeds and rushes. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. Our second lesson, our epistle lesson, comes from Paul's letter to, or excuse me, comes from the letter of St. James. Chapter 2, I'll begin the first verse. My brothers, show no partiality as you hold the faith in our Lord Jesus Christ, the Lord of glory. For if a man wearing a gold ring and fine clothing comes into your assembly, and a poor man in shabby clothing also comes in, and if you pay attention to the one who wears the fine clothing and say, you sit here in a good place, well, you say to the poor man, you stand over there or sit down at my feet, have you not then made distinctions among yourselves and become judges with evil thoughts? Listen, my beloved brothers, 
Has not God chosen those who are poor in the world to be rich in faith and heirs of the kingdom, which he's promised to those who love him? But you've dishonored the poor man. Are not the rich the ones who oppress you and the ones who drag you into court? Are they not the ones who blaspheme the honorable name by which you were called? If you, are really, if you really fulfill the royal law according to the scripture, you shall love your neighbor as yourself, you are doing well. But if you show partiality, you are committing sin and are convicted by the law as transgressors. Whoever keeps the whole law but fails at one point has become accountable for all of it. What good is it, my brothers, if someone says he has faith but does not have work? Can that faith save him? If a brother or sister is poorly clothed and lacking in daily food, and one of you says to him, Go in peace, be warmed and filled, without giving him the things needed for the body, what good is that? So also, faith by itself, if it does not have works, is dead. But someone will say, You have faith and I have works. Show me your faith apart from your works, and I will show you my faith by my works. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. For the children's lesson for today, I want to ask, uh, do you know what an action is? An action is something that we do. Um, there are certain things that we do, right? Those are actions. What about love? Is love an action? Or is love a feeling? That's a good question, right? Uh, you can feel love for someone, but you can also show love for someone, and that would be an action. Uh, maybe you show love to others. Uh, if kids might show love to a brother or sister by sharing their toys. Uh, or maybe a child might show their love to their parents by helping them to do things around the house. Um, you can even love others just by giving them a hug or helping them. Um, so love is not just a feeling. Love is something that we see in action. Imagine if um, our parents told us that they love us, but they never did anything to show that love. They never gave us anything to eat. They didn't wash our clothes. Um, they might say, I love you, but then not show it. Thankfully, parents do love their children and show that love in many ways. Well, what is faith? Is faith a feeling or an action? Is faith just something inside of us? Well, I think it's a lot like love, isn't it? Um, faith is something that's in our hearts. It's inside of us. It's a feeling we have. But faith is also going to be seen in our actions. And that's what James is talking about in, in James chapter 2, where he says, Someone will say, you have faith and I have works. Show me your faith apart from your works, and I will show you my faith by my works. Amen. Our gospel lesson comes from the Gospel of St. Mark, chapter 7, and I'll begin the 31st verse. Then he returned from the region of Tyre and went through Sidon to the Sea of Galilee in the region of the Decapolis. And they brought to him a man who was deaf and had a speech impediment. And they begged him to lay his hand on him. And taking him aside from the crowd privately, he put his fingers into his ears and after smitting, touched his tongue. And looking up to heaven, he sighed and said to him, Ephrathah, that is, be opened. And his ears were opened, his tongue was released, and he spoke plainly. And Jesus charged them to tell no one. But the more... He charged them the more zealously they proclaimed it. And they were astonished beyond measure.
saying, He has done all things well. He even makes the deaf hear and the mute speak. This is the Gospel of the Lord. Praise be to thee, O Christ. We now confess the Apostles' Creed. I believe in God the Father Almighty, maker of heaven and earth, and in Jesus Christ, his only Son, our Lord, who was conceived by the Holy Spirit, born of the Virgin Mary, suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, died, and was buried. He descended into hell. The third day he rose again from the dead. He ascended into heaven and sits at the right hand of God the Father Almighty. From thence he will come to judge the living and the dead. I believe in the Holy Spirit, the Holy Christian Church, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, and life everlasting. Amen. Our text uh, is from our Gospel lesson, Mark chapter 7, verses 31 to 37, which I read earlier, and I'm just going to read reread the following. Looking up to heaven, Jesus sighed and said to him, Ephratha, that is, be opened, and his ears were opened, his tongue was released, and he spoke plainly. Here ends the reading of our text. Once again, I'm Pastor David Becker of St. John's Lutheran Church of Aiken. Thank you for tuning in today. A number of years ago, I was at another congregation for a church meeting. I was there in my role as circuit visitor. I was there because the people in the congregation were not getting along with one another. Before the meeting started, I was sitting next to the congregational chairman, and at one point, before the meeting started, the chairman let out a big sigh. I knew why he sighed. He sighed because he was stressed about how this meeting would go. I have to admit, I was stressed too, and maybe there was a point when I let out big sigh. For the most part, when we hear a person sigh, we think something is wrong. A person might sigh because they're down or depressed. A person might sigh because something's bothering them or something saddens them. Oh sure, there might be times when there is a, a sigh of relief, a sigh that comes out because something is done. All of this might lead us to wonder, why did Jesus sigh here in our text? Why did he sigh just before he heals the man who is deaf? Now remember, he healed them, or he sighed before he healed the man. So it wasn't a sigh of relief. It wasn't, well, I got that done. He hadn't yet completed the healing. So the fact that Jesus sighed probably means something is wrong. What could possibly be wrong? Jesus was about to work a wonderful miracle. You wouldn't think that would sadden him. Jesus was about to change a man's life for the better. That's not something that would depress a person. So why does Jesus sigh? Let me ask you a question. Have you ever done something good knowing that something bad's gonna happen as a result? What I'm talking about is that before you do whatever it is, you know that there's going to be a certain person or persons who's going to misconstrue what you do. You know that they're going to condemn you for whatever it is that you do. You know what's going to happen. You know, though, that you need to do it. But you know that people are going to make your life miserable because you do it. So, before you do whatever it is, you might sigh. Well, let me tell you, that's why Jesus sighed. Jesus wanted to heal the man who was deaf, but he also knew that there would be certain people who were going to misconstrue what he would do. That's why Jesus took the man away from the crowd. He wanted to heal the man in private, and once he healed the man, he told him, and the people who were with him, tell no one. Now this may sound strange to us, after all, we're told that those who witnessed the miracle, even though they were told not to, were saying how wonderful Jesus is. They said he had done all things well, he even makes the deaf hear and the mute speak. What could be 
possibly be wrong with them telling others about Jesus. Isn't that what we're supposed to do? Well, what's wrong with it is this. The people will think that Jesus is only a miracle worker. If you have a problem, they're going to think Jesus can fix it. No matter what a person's problem was, they're going to think all one needs to do is sprinkle a little of Jesus on it, and it's going to go away. They didn't understand that Jesus had come into the world to be more than just a miracle worker. Jesus had come in the world to be our Savior. Jesus had come to do all that was necessary so that we can be saved from the punishment we deserve for our sin. It's not just the people back then who had the wrong idea about who Jesus is and what he, what he did. There are people today who think, oh, he was a great man, or he's a great teacher. Even the Muslims say he was a great prophet. But what they don't say or believe is that he is the only savior of the world. Jesus did not want people to misunderstand who he is. That's why he sighed. That's why he told the people to be quiet about the miracle he performed. He didn't want there to be a false understanding of him and his mission. Such misunderstanding would lead people to reject his gospel message. The message that says, we are saved by grace through faith for Christ's sake. That's why Jesus sighed. And yet, what did Jesus do? He still healed the man. Think about it. Jesus knew all of our sin. Jesus knew all of our disobedience, all of our acts of rebellion. And what did he do? He came into the world and died on the cross for our sin. His love for us led him to the cross. We're not told that he sighed when he was hanging on the cross, but we are told he said, Father, forgive them, for they do not know what they are doing. And that's what it's all about. It's all about forgiveness. It's all about our salvation. It's all about our adoption into God's family. From the very beginning, God knew how sinful and corrupt we would all be, yet he promised and sent his son to die for us. Jesus fully knew what would happen to him when he came down from heaven to be our Savior, yet he came anyway. And was, when Jesus was hanging on the cross, he didn't. Sigh a sigh of despair or defeat. Instead, he proclaimed, it is finished. He proclaimed his victory before he breathed his last. And that, that is, though, until the third day, when he rose from the dead to show that he had done all that was necessary for our salvation. There's nothing for us to sigh about unless it's a sigh of relief. The fact that through Jesus we have forgiveness and the promise of heaven is reason to rejoice. Just as the life of the deaf, deaf man was changed drastically on the day he was healed, so also our lives are changed drastically on the day of our baptism. We have been baptized into Christ's death and resurrection. Faith has been worked in our hearts and we know who Jesus is and what he has done. Amen. Now may the peace of God, which surpasses all understanding, keep your hearts and your minds in Christ Jesus. Amen. We pray. Almighty God, Lord of heaven and earth, who keeps faith forever, grant us a living faith in your Son, our Lord Jesus Christ. Though sin and Satan would stop our hearts and ears and open them, open them, so that we hear your word of life and salvation. Take it to heart and acknowledge your holy commands and speak plainly with joyful lips your word of truth to all the world and do works of faith in daily life. Almighty God, our King, we pray for those who rule and govern us, the president, the legislature, and all who judge our laws. Grant justice in our land for the rich and poor Unite our country and communities in godly, common causes for our well-being. Keep safe those whose lives are in danger because of their service, especially police, firefighters, and the military. Wherever our rulers or our laws are contrary to your will and truth, turn us from our ears. 
Almighty God and Father, your Son, our Shepherd, did all things well. We pray for his gospel to be proclaimed with might and power. By your Holy Spirit, season our daily speech with the truth of your grace and mercy and the redemption won for us in Christ Jesus. So also bless those who serve as pastors and all who are ordained and to proclaim your gospel and minister your sacraments so that they may make known both your unyielding law and your precious gospel. Almighty God and Father, we give you thanks for having chosen to make the poor rich in faith and heirs of the kingdom. Even as our Lord Jesus showed no partiality, but welcomed the poor, the sick, the handicapped, the marginalized, grant grace to your church, so that we do not neglect but joyfully serve the needy. Almighty God and Father, you say to all with anxious hearts, be strong, fear not. You healed the sick and defeated death by your resurrection. In your good time and according to your gracious will, heal the sick and comfort the suffering, especially those that we now name in our hearts. Almighty God and Father, the help of all who cry to you, be gracious to the poor, the unemployed, the underemployed, and all who suffer hunger, want, and need. Open the hearts of your people so that wherever there is abundance, we might share the blessings you give to us. Father, into your hands we commend all for whom we pray, through Jesus Christ, your Son, our Lord, who lives and reigns with you, and the Holy Spirit, one God, now and forever. Amen. And we pray together the Lord's Prayer. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever and ever. Amen. Receive now the benediction. The Lord bless you and keep you. The Lord make his face shine upon you and be gracious unto you. The Lord lift up his countenance upon you and give you peace. Amen. Once again, I'm Pastor David Becker of St. John's Lutheran Church of Aiken. Thank you for tuning in today. I pray that you'll have a blessed week.